Ash, welcome back. Thank you very much for joining me. Hello, my darlings. Lovely to see you all. Uh, today, I've got a stack of stuff to get through. So much, actually, that it will be easier if I just didn't give you the menu. I went right into it. Uh, but no. <laughs> As an exercise in time wasting, I can tell you that I'm going to do Trump versus McConnell because Trump is trying to get McConnell out of office, basically. Something that a lot of people would cheer, but Trump is doing it for his own particular reasons, and I thought I'd find out what was going to happen between them. Also, the Haitian refugees, and oh, yeah, I did transition pitches, really interesting transition pitches for Pulitzer Prize winning astrophysicist Carl Sagan. A load of people asked for him, and I didn't know why. Why is he so popular? And now I do. Thank you to everybody who subscribed this week, pushing us way, way past the 25,000 mark. I'm really grateful. Welcome. Lovely to see you too. Thank you to all the donors, of course. You know how grateful I am. I really appreciate your appreciation, so thank you for that. And also a big thank you to the commenters this week. Lots of those. A lot of people ask about the ghosts in the house and want an update on that. There were real problems. There were candles lighting themselves, doors closing, cushions flying around, locks unlocking. It was getting really rough. And so I mentioned it and a lot of you went to work. You just got in there and sent light and you suggested ways of dealing with it. And I've not had a problem with ghosts since. That's remarkable. So thank you for that, for all your efforts you put in. It clearly worked. It's amazing. Uh, the only thing that's outstanding still is that, remember I used to have like hands brushing across my hair? It's like little fingers running across my hair as if a fly's landed on your head and you brush it away. Uh, plus somebody kissed me on the lips. Remember that? While I was meditating, this cold pair of lips landed on mine. <laughs> But the touching of the hair has got really a lot worse, a lot more pronounced. It's now like people running their fingers through my hair. And it's happening all the time. It's like, yeah, stop, stop, stop. Somebody said that was encouraging. Okay. <laughs> Uh, oh, I should give a big thank you to Marie of Marie's Table. Somebody pointed out that she'd said the loveliest things on her channel. Thank you, Marie. That was very, very kind of you. Uh, she did Epstein. She had a look at Epstein's crossover transition thing, and she didn't come to a different result. She was convinced he was dead, but he couldn't cross over in the usual way. There was something evil about that, and that would indeed verify what I saw in my pictures too. But thank you, Marie. That was really, really lovely of you. Other people have asked me about Kim Jong-un. Now, I've done him a couple of times. The first time, he was lying on a bed. I held my hand over his mouth and could feel his breath, but he wasn't moving. I thought he might be in a coma or something. Well, recently, he's reappeared magically. But I tried the transition pictures for him. If you remember, back in February, maybe? And there was a tunnel, but it had like a spiral in it, like a screw hole, that he was walking around gradually, going around, round, 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 up, down, up, down. But uh, I couldn't get him to transition either. He was another one. Oh, I should just mention Mark Meadows. Remember Mark Meadows' pictures where he was striding jauntily along, thinking he was absolutely fine? And then suddenly there was a mudslide or avalanche directly ahead of him, and it stopped him in his tracks, and he couldn't go any further, and he had to wrestle with this whole thing, which could involve him falling down a cliff face if he didn't cling on properly. Well, he's just been subpoenaed by the January 6th committee and uh, is going to have to give testimony there. So uh, that, I would say, is that avalanche. He was quite happy up to that point. Then the subpoena arrived and <laughs> mudslide, mudslide, hazard, hazard. Uh, not good for him, I would say. Oh, and of course, Steve Bannon too. Remember I said that he would eventually go through a really tight time, which might force him to reconsider his plans for the future. Well, he was subpoenaed as well. And it looks like uh, that could contribute to that whole situation. So the pictures came true on that. And finally, somebody called Karen asked, how do you get out of your head? Uh, meaning when you do all these pictures all the time, how do you get out of your head? How do you stop intellectualizing about things? Well, the truth is, 
I'm not really in my head. I like to think I'm in my being. I don't simply observe life or analyze it or judge it. I'm experiencing it, feeling it, and so on. Uh, which is why I don't drive, really. Because, I mean, did I tell you I don't drive? But I don't drive because you're hermetically sealed inside a box and you're cut off in a form of sensory deprivation from the outside world. Whereas when you walk, as I do in my barefoot shoes, whereas I walk slowly along, I'm able to smell flowers, smell restaurants or people's laundry turning over. I'm able to hear birds and stop and see trees and touch things. It's really important to me that. And so I'm not in my head all the time. I'm in my being. And I think that's really, really important. All right, so let's get on with China. I saw a video of Whimsy's the other day. Have you watched Whimsy's video, The Oracle of Whimsy? She's really, really good. And she did a remote about the future of China's economy. She did a brilliant job, and I'm not going to tell you what it is, because I think you should go and look at her video. But I thought, yeah, I could just take a look at the Chinese economy myself and see what the pictures hold for that. Because China has the second largest economy in the world. It's plowed a ton of investment into infrastructure, which America isn't doing. And if the dilly-dallying continues in America, as the two parties fight and squabble and argue over something which is so integral to the growth of a country, then America will slip behind China in terms of the most prosperous country in the world. More recently, they run into problems with the China Evergrande Group, which is the second largest property developer in the country. That group is having liquidity problems as are various local economies around the country. And they may, by investing so much in infrastructure, have overreached themselves. So people are very worried about what is going to happen to China. It's a very quick snapshot, really. When I went into the energy, China was standing on a cliff overlooking the ocean. And it was blowing one of those really, really stiff breezes that you get when you stand on an ocean cliff. <laughs> so I moved inland a little. And there was a city there or something. Uh, the wind was buffeting this city like crazy. And in the end, all the buildings huddled together. They all leaned in like, we can brave this. We can brave it out. We've been here for thousands of years. This is just a blip. And that's what they did. But it did seem like there was pressure there. Because a lot of these local economies are going, you know, I know we have a debt problem, but if we were to become a little bit more commercial, if we were to go down the capitalist route a little bit more, we could bring in money and pay our debts. And of course, the central government goes, no, no, we want less capitalism, not more. Capitalism will ruin the country. China, no. Just take it from me. But they've invested a ton of money in infrastructure and look like they could be overreaching themselves and their economy could cool in the next few months or a couple of years because that wind was sharp and harsh and blowing a fierce, as they say in maritime communities, I'm sure. I also took a look at Alan West, who's an ex-army colonel. I didn't know that. He served in Iraq. Uh, he also was in the U.S. House of Representatives for a couple of years before becoming chairman of the Republican Party in Texas. At one point, he claimed that a large number of Democrats in Congress were communists, <laughs> a completely baseless allegation. I think he was branded anti-Islam at one point as well. And of course, because he's a Trump guy, is anti-COVID mandates and mask mandates and so on. And he even may have been injured in an uh, accident during a protest about COVID last year. But anyway, so uh, he is running for governor, he said, and possibly may go up against Beto O'Rourke. So I thought, yeah, I'll take a look and see how his run for governor might go. And when I found him, he was sitting on a... What would it be? It was like a car, only without a car chassis in it. Thank you. Can't draw cars. Thank you. Uh, it was just the base of the car with four wheels, basically, and a gear stick. And he was driving it along. 
very confident in himself. He has a lot of poise, this guy, I think, a lot of style, and really believes in himself, which would carry him a long way, of course. And he drives along, drives along, and everything is sort of okay for a while. And then as he reaches the end of the year, and those hills I always see that seem to demarcate one year from another, the go-kart looking car runs into a, a hill of some kind or a, a, a lump of something. I'm not quite sure what it is. And just basically runs aground and he has to get off. So it's possible that he quits or something goes wrong with his campaign or whatever, because this is a very difficult time for him. And it may cause him to switch from plan A, Alan for governor, to plan B, brave face, pretend that never happened, move on. <laughs> Possibly. But he climbs the hill and he ends up on a very large open salt flat type thing, like a plane. Now that could mean, because it's sunny and bright, that he has a very smooth run through. And Texas goes, yeah, we'd like you as governor. This Greg Abbott guy is a disaster. Beto O'Rourke, not even interested. Can't even pronounce his name. Let's go with Alan West. Maybe that happens and it's an easy breezy time. He goes ahead. And when he approaches the end of next year, there's a town of some kind. But it's a bit like those ancient towns that you visit on vacation, where they've excavated them and the walls only go up like two feet because everything else is destroyed. They're just basically archaeological digs. It was a bit like that, a town that had once held so much busyness and so much hope and so much prosperity and now was laid flat. There was just nothing there when he got there. So maybe plan A fails and he doesn't even bother with plan B. But if he does bother with plan B and presses ahead, based on today's energy, it doesn't look like he makes much progress. Or the election is a very empty experience when he gets there. Remember those Andrew Yang pictures where he could see this bright, shiny thing in the distance and he goes, oh, what's that? I must go and look. That was the mayoral race, as Americans say, and he didn't succeed. He went in it, he went out the other side and said, well, okay, I didn't win, but it was a thrill. I really enjoyed doing it. And that's exactly what the picture said would happen. So the same goes with Alan West, really. Maybe he just enjoys the process, but he encounters a problem halfway through. And uh, we'll have to see. I also took a look at the Haitian refugee situation in Del Rio, Texas. There are about 10 to 15,000 of these people who've been camping under a bridge by the river there, and the authorities have just moved them on. But amid much controversy for the Biden administration, because they showed pictures of guys on horseback, border patrol guards on horseback with straps whipping these people. It was incredibly inhumane. I thought asylum was just like, I need help, please let me in. But it, there's actually a protocol for it. You have to go in through a proper port of entry. You can't just stroll in and go, well, I'm here now, I might as well stay. That doesn't work. You've either got to be in America and say, I'm afraid to go home. They're going to kill me if I go. That's one reason. Or you come in through a port of entry and say, I'm not going back there. Those people are lethal. And these Haitian people, they are here because back home, there is gang violence and the threat of a coup. There may actually be a gang, a street gang, runs the country eventually. So they fear for their lives. But the underlying issue here is, was this orchestrated in some way? Is this some sinister plot to make the Biden administration look bad? Because if it is, yeah, it worked. Well done. Uh, I don't know, but the interesting thing is because I don't predict anything, I don't make predictions about the future, I simply look at the landscape of how things are situated based on today's energy. I thought, what if I were able to go into the past as well? and look at how things came about. I've never done this before. This is a first for me. What happens if I did that and went back? So, I went into the energy for the Haitian refugees and there was a bridge there. Bridges are usually about change, a new direction, something different happening. And these refugees were trekking across the top, set against the sun. Rather than following them forward initially, I traced them back. 
along the bridge. And there was a slope up, and they were coming up the slope. And when I looked down, it was like a swamp, a big, gooey, brown bog with people stuck in it. And some would never escape. They were too deep in the bog. Others were making their way, striding toward the sides, trying to get out. And there was somebody on the side who I didn't feel was indigenous. I could be wrong, but I didn't feel was indigenous. There was somebody on the side waving them, saying, come on, there's more room, come on, hurry, hurry, hurry. There's plenty of room on the bridge, come on. Waving them on. And they go, wow, hope. There's a chance we can escape this hell hole we're living in and go and have a bright new future in America. Come on, the more of you, the merrier, on this bridge. And they went across the bridge. So there was something going on to stimulate their interest. Part of it was a need to survive, no doubt about that. But somebody seemed to be fueling that need and their desire to leave so that they would climb on the bridge and go for asylum. I crossed over the bridge. And on the other side, you could see that they weren't at the level, the correct level, to enter America. They just weren't. And indeed, many of them have been turned away and deported. But some of them persisted. Some of them were processed. And they went up this little slope and found themselves up at the right level. They turned left from the little slope onto the main area. Left means new direction. And there was a big wide open space there. So some of them are going to get integrated. Some of them will be accepted. And their asylum applications will work. I guess some of them will not make it. I also did Trump versus McConnell. Now, if you've read Michael Wolff's book, Landslide, you know that Trump hates McConnell and McConnell hates Trump. <laughs> That's no secret at all. And in previous pictures I did a long time ago, it showed Trump taking aim at McConnell and McConnell hiding behind his shield and then running away. Just anything to avoid this guy and his attacks. McConnell recently has developed a spine, apparently, because he's now saying, oh, Trump, pa. He's a fading brand. He's a retiring racehorse. Dump him and stick with the Republican Party. Because if the Republican Party becomes the MAGA Party 100%, there will be no Republican Party left. And uh, what he's doing, basically, he's finding uh, candidates for various elections who will stand up to the candidates that Trump is putting forward. So Trump's response to that is, we need to get rid of Mitch McConnell. This guy is hopeless. And he calls him, at some point, sullen and unsmiling, lacking political insight, wisdom, skill, and personality. And he has too many chins and not enough smarts. <laughs> there may be elements of truth to that, but he doesn't lack political insight, that's for sure. Mitch McConnell knows what he's doing. So I thought I'd put the two side by side and see how they fared in the coming weeks and months. And when I did so, Trump was there, solid, just standing his ground. And McConnell, knowing he has to get past this big lump in front of him, turns his back and goes, coming through, coming through, excuse me, excuse me, like you do in a supermarket, excuse me. He just marches on. Don't look back. Don't look back. Mustn't look in his eyes. He'll turn me to stone. Don't look back. And he marches on and on and on. But eventually, he walks into a mist. We know that mists mean uncertainty, problems that need solving, not sure which direction to go, a lot of tumultuous action all at the same time. If Mitch McConnell finds a ramp, there's one at either side, if he finds this ramp and goes up it, it leads to a path whereby he can go, hey, Maybe it's confusing down there, but I am up here and this is how I'm going to go. Almost like his own subjective reality he's living out. Fashions his own future, his own reality, and ignores Trump completely. If he doesn't judge this right, he ends up downstairs rather than upstairs, where there is a tunnel. And in this tunnel, things get really dark and challenging and problematical. There are various ways you can go within the tunnel, none of them good. There are crossroads, there are points where he has to go, I don't know what to do. 
if I do this, that'll happen. If I do that, you know, it seems kind of bleak for a while. And Trump, standing over here, looks at the mist in the distance and goes, oh no, poor Mitch McConnell having problems. Who on earth would ever wish that on him? Pleased with himself that things are not going well for Mitch McConnell. But if Mitch carries on within the tunnel and just presses on as he will, I guess, unless it's illness or something, if there's ill health involved here, that might be a problem. But if he continues, it leads him out of the tunnel later on into an area so far away from where Trump is that Trump becomes distant history. McConnell is not affected by him at all. So it seems that no matter what Trump is thinking and no matter what Trump does, McConnell, who is probably 5,000 times smarter and more strategic, has got ways of figuring out the plot, no matter what happens. Even if he loses his job, he gets a, a lucrative speaking tour, a book deal. He'll be fine as long as his health doesn't give out. Uh, but this is going to be a trying time for him. And one that will require all the ingenuity he has and all the political savvy uh, in order to survive. And finally, I did transition pictures for astrophysicist Carl Sagan, who died in 1996 at the age of 62 of pneumonia, although he had a bout with cancer leading up to that. This guy had an intellect the size of Venus. He wrote hundreds of scientific papers. He wrote books. He wrote uh, the movie Contact, I think the one with Jodie Foster, because he believed in extraterrestrial life. He didn't think, actually, that extraterrestrials were coming here as often as people believe they were, because if there were that many planets in the galaxy and the universe, why would they keep picking on us, really? But he was very open-minded in that way. And also, interestingly, from our point of view, he was an agnostic. He didn't wholeheartedly deny the existence of God. In fact, he wrote... Some people think God is an outsized, light-skinned male with a long white beard sitting on a throne somewhere up there in the sky, busily tallying the fall of every sparrow. Others consider God to be essentially the sum total of the physical laws which describe the universe. I do not know of any compelling evidence for anthropomorphic patriarchs controlling human destiny from some hidden celestial vantage point. But it would be madness to deny the existence of physical laws. So he was open. He was a man of wonder. He looked at the universe like a child looks at it, wanting to learn and know more and find out how things work and why they're there and so on. Which made him a fascinating subject for the transition pictures. When I went into the energy, there was this cave thing I always see. Metaphorical cave, it doesn't really exist, but it's a setting for what the person is about to experience. When I went in, there was a frame, a four poster frame made of aluminium, aluminum as Americans call it. And he was inside the four legs of this frame. Which is really interesting because it suggested that that was the limit of his knowledge and of his expectation of learning. Facts. Science. Something rigid that you could depend on. Nothing bigger than that. Even though he could see there was something bigger out beyond the frame, it had to be fitted into the framework that he already believed in. But he can't just stay there, because the current that's involved in these processes is constantly pulling the soul, the consciousness forward. And he stepped out of the frame and started walking down towards the tunnel. But he didn't seem involved in what was going on. Which, for a man like him, I thought was odd. Why would he not be interested in this amazing experience that he was going through? That his consciousness was going through? And you know what I thought? I thought, what if, instead of following him through the tunnel like I normally do, 
I tried to see the entire process through his eyes. Maybe that's why he's not interested, because something else is going on that he can see and I can't. Right? So I went in and the cave was not there in his consciousness. He was standing against a brick wall. Plain. Boring. So he started walking. And as he went, he entered a series of brick-walled passageways. There was no magic to it. He wasn't looking around going, ooh, this is amazing, because there was nothing to be amazed by. He just carried on walking around and around, following his nose, bricks on either side, very, very pragmatic, moving forward, nothing to see here. But he went on for a very long time. It was wearing him down. It's like, just keep him going. Eventually, he'll mellow. He'll see that there's more to this process than uh, he's been expecting. Now, I came out of him, out of his eyes, and I looked where he was. And he was at the dome. He was actually the normal thing I see. That um, dome of light that always seems to be there at the end of this tunnel. Only... When I went back in again, he wasn't seeing the dome. He was seeing... Hmm, he was seeing... It's hard to describe. It was like a wall of a jelly-like substance. Now, he was fascinated by this. There was a sort of luminescence to it. There were lights behind it. Ah, now what's this? This... I really am curious about. And he went over and he pushed his hand into the jelly or the jelloid substance. And it sank in and it was warm. It was like sticking your hand in custard or something and skin tight. It just hugged his arm. And it continued accepting him. It was very welcoming, very inviting tantalizing almost like what is this feeling where does it lead what's going on behind this jelloid wall and it slowly absorbed him and you would think well i won't go too far because i won't be able to breathe but there's no air to breathe you don't breathe here he just went into it face first i was like whoa wow and it absorbed him, and it closed around him, and he vanished into it. Having finished that, I went back to the original pictures, the ones that I would see doing what I do. And he was walking up the tunnel in the normal way. He comes to the dome, he reaches into it in the same way that he did with the jelloid wall, goes further, goes further. He's quite intrigued by it all, and then just walks into it and vanishes. So it's the same end, just with a different experience depending on the person you are and what your subjective reality is. And it made me think that we don't choose what happens to us after we die. Maybe we choose it before we die. We earn it. We get given the end that we have trained ourselves to accept. Maybe that's it. Carl Sagan, as brilliant and accomplished a man as he was on the mortal side, had basically trained himself to be so analytical and scientific and pragmatic that he got that kind of transition. Whereas somebody else who was invested in the spiritual side in a big way would get something else, something more fitting to what they had earned in their lifetime. But in the end, According to this, 
the welcome we receive is the same for everybody. No matter what we believe, no matter what our expectations are, no matter what our subjective perception of reality is, we all end up in the same place. And how fast we get there and in what state depends on how much restriction we place on ourselves in life. It can be easy, it can be hard and long-winded. It seems to be a choice. A choice that we can take responsibility for and enjoy or suffer, I suppose, the results later. It's all down to us in the end. The more we connect with the divine splinter inside of us to our understanding of God, of infinite intelligence, the easier our passage from form to formless is likely to be. And that's what I learned from Carl Sagan. Thank you very much for watching. I really appreciate it. Subscribe, like, share. I always say that, but if you would, that'd be great. Follow me on Twitter if you want to. At Cash Peters, that'd be good too. Otherwise, I'll see you next time, guys. Bye bye.